delighted to be joined by Lord Billamore here today. He's the co-founder and chairman at Cobra Beers, a former president and vice president of the CBI, and an active crossbench member of the House of Lords, and he will be speaking about his business career and also about uh, the state of the economy and politics more broadly. Um, we look forward to hearing his insights on all these topics, and since I know we're already a little bit, a few minutes late, I think without further ado, I will pass it to him to give some remarks before we open up to questions. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. And a very warm welcome that you've given me, and great to be with all of you here. Before we go any further, how many of you are, are students at Oxford University now? Wonderful. How many of you are undergrads? Any postgrads? Okay. I've just come from uh, Kellogg College, where I'm a fellow, um, and I'm also a fellow at the Side Business School. So I've got two appointments here, and uh, two at the other place. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I did my undergrad uh, studies uh, there, and I'm a fellow of my college at Sydney Sussex. And our sister college here is St. John's. Anyone from John's here? No? Okay. And I'm also uh, a fellow at the Judge Business School at Cambridge as well. So, you know, I'm called a traitor there and I'm called a traitor here. <laughs> so what do you do? Uh, there's a, a famous Indian economist who said that um, if you have one foot on hot coals and another foot on freezing cold ice, on average, you're comfortable. <laughs> so I've got one foot in dark blue, <laughs> one foot in light blue, <laughs> so I'm a true blue. <laughs> now, uh, what I'm going to do is just speak for a few minutes and um, just set the scene, and then I'm happy to talk about anything um, that you want to after you can ask me questions about anything. So a quick potted history, born and brought up in India, Father was in the Indian Army, moved around a lot, went to seven different schools, ended up at school at, uh, in a boarding school 8,000 feet high in South India in a place called Uti, and it's the last and only British boarding school still left in India. We're about to celebrate our 125th anniversary in April. And I finished there, and by the way, the school was carefully chosen by the British in that location because they wanted to replicate Britain at its best including the wonderful weather we've got outside. It rains a lot in Uti. And in my time, they went even further. They replicated British food at its worst. <laughs> we had boiled meat, boiled potatoes. Horrible. I mean, it was inedible. And so um, I went to university in India, skipped a couple of years. I went to university at the age of 16, a uh, lucky break, graduated at 19, and came to England. I studied here for seven years, did a law degree, qualified as a chartered accountant with EY with Ernst & Young, and then started my business, Cobra Beer. Uh, and then eventually got into public service about 25 years ago, and ended up joining the House of Lords in 2006. And when I joined the House of Lords, coming up to now 18 years, I was the third youngest peer in the House of Lords. I'm still one of the younger peers in the House of Lords. Our average age is 72, so a lot of wisdom. And by the way, if you'd like to know more, I'm, I'm, I'm a passionate believer in our constitution and the way it works in the House of Lords and the role that it plays. So if you'd like to have a discussion about that, I'm more than happy to do that later on. So I built Cobra Beer, House of Lords, and then since then I've also got into academics. You've heard about my roles here at Oxford and at Cambridge. I was the youngest university chancellor in the country as Chancellor of the University of West London, which was great for five years. And for the last nine and a half years, I've been Chancellor of the University of Birmingham, one of our big Russell Group universities. So academics, politics, and business are the mainstay of my, my life, and I love it that way. So one of the things I realized, and I didn't realize it until eight years after I started in business, the first eight years was just head down trying to get Cobra Beer off the ground. And then I started by chance introduction to study in addition to my work. And I went to the Cranfield School of Management and did a course there, became an alumnus. <coughs> then I went to Harvard Business School. I went there for nine years and carried on going back for another seven years as an alumnus for refreshers. And I also went to the London Business School. So I've been to three business schools and I'm alumnus of three business schools. And that whole concept of lifelong learning 
is something that I passionately believe in. And in fact, I've just embarked on starting, just started a doctorate. I've got all these honorary doctorates, but I don't have the real thing. Any PhD students here? DPhils? Yes? Okay, only one. Any of you maybe going to do a <coughs> DPhil or PhD? Want to? No? Perhaps? Okay, but it's something I always wanted to do, and I've started. I'm doing it back at, back at the other place. And um, we'll, I, I can talk to you about that, because it's about leadership. And it's based on my community. I come from the smallest community in the world. I'm a Zoroastrian Parsi. Anyone heard of Zoroastrian Parsis? Yes, well, well that's more hands than normal. <laughs> Normally I have to say, have you heard of Freddie Mercury? Yes. <laughs> or Queen? Oh, yes, you know. Have you heard of the Tatas? Uh, the owners of Jaguar Land Rover, Tata Sea. Uh, oh, yes, and they say, right. So this tiny community, 100,000 people, which we went as refugees from Iran, where you had your Persian background. So uh, we went over a 1,000 years ago. Um, and we settled in India and have been a huge success in India from the time, you know, pre-independence, post-independence, and it's been a hugely successful community. So, you know, what is it that makes this little community uh, so successful is, is something that I'm, I'm researching and comparing with other communities. So when I went back to Harvard for one of my refreshers, it was in January 2017, and two major global events had taken place in 2016. Uh, could you perhaps tell me one of them? What happened in 2016? Brexit. Brexit. Brexit was one of them in June 2016. Trump. Trump. There you go. Well done. Well done. So Brexit and Trump. So this professor, who's one of the best, best teachers I've ever had in my life, who's a political um, economist, Professor Ravi Abdullah at Harvard Business School, he said, now, I'm going to give you the fault lines of Brexit and Trump and analyze them. And I've done a lot of research on this. And he then proceeded to take us through rural, urban, pro-Brexit, pro-Trump, pro-immigration, anti-immigration, pro-Brexit, pro-Trump. More educated, less educated. Every fault line he went through, people who voted for Trump and people who voted for Brexit, it was identical. And he said, well, let me summarize this whole lecture. And he showed us a graph that I will never forget. It's imprinted on my memory for the rest of my life. And the graph started in 1815. Can you tell me what happened in 1815? Major, yes? Congress of Vienna, but what happened, what was a big, big event that happened? A, a major battle. Waterloo. Waterloo. Sorry, anyone from France, apologies, apologies. <laughs> Battle of Waterloo. <coughs> Battle of Waterloo, which, by the way, Napoleon should have won that battle. And if Marshal Blucher hadn't turned up, he would have won that battle. As a Prussian-German general who turned up, that saved Wellington, and Wellington won that battle. And if you come to the House of Lords, into the, in the Royal Gallery, we have two amazing, giant paintings. And one is of the Battle of Waterloo, one is of the Battle of Trafalgar, 1805-1815. And it, the painting of the Battle of Waterloo shows Wellington and Marshal Blucher shaking hands at the end of the battle. So, that, Europe had been at war for years. That battle brought peace to Europe for literally a century. And the graph of globalization started right at the bottom. No globalization at that stage. War. And it showed the rise of globalization all the way through the 1800s up until the early 1900s. What happened there? The empires grew, the British Empire, the Gilded Age in America, prosperity, global trade, more than ever before. And it peaked in the early 1900s. And then what happened? World War I. World War I. And there's an American author who's written a book about the build-up to World War I. I can't remember her name. And she describes it like watching a train crash in slow motion. A war that should never have taken place. A horrible war that lasted for four years, followed by the Spanish flu. Globalization plummets all the way back down to where it was in 1815. 
it picks up again in between the First and Second World Wars. The Second World War caused by the First World War gets up to about here. Obviously, Second World War plummets again. Then it shows the graph going back down to the level of 1815, rising and rising and rising and rising and rising up to the level it was in the early 1900s. And this is January 2017. And he said, if history repeats itself, I'm sorry to say, we're in for conflict. And look at what's happened. And look at what is happening in the world today. So here they say the best way to predict the future is look to the past. And history just keeps repeating itself. Now, Brexit. By the way, how many of you think that Brexit was an unmitigated, stupid act of self-harm and a huge mistake? Can I just see a show of hands, please? Normally, when I ask this question, every hand in the room goes up. So how many of you think Brexit was a great idea? No? It was a disaster. It was a stupid thing to have happened. Um, and we've had eight years of this country being completely messed up, starting uh, with Brexit. So we can talk about that in, in, in more detail. So I've been to the Middle East a lot. I've been to Israel many times. And I went to Israel, the last visit in the Middle East was in Dubai, just now. When I was in Dubai in November, when I attended COP28, the climate change conference. Fantastic. It was a great, great. It was the best COP ever. Um, the biggest, I, was, I played a big role in the COP26 in Glasgow when I was president of the Confederation of British Industry. We thought we did a great job. The UA took it to another level. In May last year, I, I went to Israel on an official parliamentary visit. Only parliamentarians hosted by the Israel government. How many of you have been to Israel? Can I just see a show of hands? Okay, a few of you. How many of you have been to the Middle East? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. Now, I've been to Israel many times. This visit was a week-long visit, and we were in the Knesset, we met with you know, everyone. We went to the Karam Shalom crossing on the corner of Gaza and Israel and Egypt. That crossing was closed for one hour for the parliamentary delegation to visit this crossing and see it firsthand. And we, were, we went on the ground, and it's as close as I could get to going into Gaza itself. And they explained everything to us. Do you know how many lorries go there every day normally? We're talking about aid going in 10 trucks, 20 trucks a day. It's a big thing, or another 10 trucks of aid have gone in, humanitarian aid, help. 500 per day. And around the corner from Egypt is a rougher crossing, another 100 go in. 600 lorries go in and out of Gaza every single day. And look what's happened since October the 7th. And then the people crossing is further up in the north of Gaza into Israel, where a lot of people go into work in Israel and go back. So we saw this on the ground. We went up. Um, we're taken by the IDF to a viewpoint where we could look onto Gaza City and a whole part of Gaza. It's a very small area. We're so literally looking out onto it. And he said, you know, we're warning you. We're within sight of Hamas. They probably have their guns trained on you right now. They can pull the trigger and I'm sorry, you're dead. But I can assure you they wouldn't dare do that. You're absolutely safe. We went to see the Iron Dome, the rockets that were being fired. In the four weeks that we'd been there, 1,000 rockets had been fired, all of them shot down by the Iron Dome. We were completely disillusioned with Israeli politics, with what was happening. And I realized how lucky we are in this country that we have a parliamentary system that has an upper house, a senate, a house of lords. Israel's biggest problem is they don't have a Senate. They have the Knesset, which is a unicameral parliament. 
They have no upper house. They have no check and balance. Their only check and balance is their judiciary. And what Netanyahu has been trying to do is to tamper with the judiciary. And if you, while we were there, there was weekend, every weekend there was a protest, every weekend a protest saying, you can't do this. Why? Because if you tamper with the judiciary, you're de destroying your democracy. Whereas here we have the House of Commons, House of Lords, and then on top of that we have our judiciary as well as a fallback. There they don't have that layer of a check and balance in Parliament. Huge weakness. So we came away disillusioned with Israeli politics. And we went to the West Bank, met with the Palestinian Authority, round table meeting with the Deputy Prime Minister, came away completely disillusioned. They felt helpless, there was no democracy in, her, in either Gaza or the West Bank since 2007. So no democracy. Hamas and Fatah don't talk to each other. And they said, we're just helpless. Victim, victim, victim. Then we speak to the Palestinian youth, and they're completely disillusioned with their leadership, who they see as corrupt and useless. So we literally came away from that visit pretty despondent. We literally thought there is no chance of a two-state solution over here ever with the way things are. But the one thing we came away thinking was Israel was 100% on top of its own security and were all there. And at least they were right on top of their security. Not one of us could have predicted what happened on October the 7th. And then the sadness since then, the horror, the tragedies. I weep when I see the scenes on television. I weep when I think of the 130 hostages that are still there. So this is what we're dealing with, unpredicted situations. And if you think about it, with crises, they come out of the blue. 9-11, who predicted 9-11? Nobody predicted 9-11. It changed the world. It led to an invasion of Afghanistan, the first time NATO's Article 5 has ever and only time been implemented. And it was meant to be to, to, to get rid of Al-Qaeda. They ended up staying there for 20 years. And then you had that horrible withdrawal from Afghanistan, which was ghastly. Who predicted the financial crisis in 2008-9? Less than a handful of economists. Imagine the Queen went to open a building at the LSE, and all these famous economists there in 2009. And she said to them, why didn't any of you see it coming? Yeah. Who predicted, who predicted the pandemic? The biggest crisis globally since the Second World War. And the way we dealt with it, with the lockdowns, again, I'd be happy to deal with that as President of the CBI was in the thick of it. Next, who predicted Russia would invade Ukraine on the 24th of February, 2022. No, oh, they'll never do it. They'll never do it. They did. And who predicted October the 7th and what's happened since then? So the thing about when you call them black swan events, most crises come out of the blue and people don't predict them. It's how you deal with them that matters. And with that, I just want to, before we open it up to questions, just touch on my own business, Cobra Beer, which I started from scratch. I came up with the idea while I was an undergraduate reading law at Cambridge. I did not jump out of a bath naked and run down the streets. It was not a eureka moment. It was an idea that developed. And like most, um, by the way, how many of you know Cobra Beer and drink of it? Thank you for your support. Thank you. Uh, the thing about it is most business ideas are really simple. And um, my idea was a very simple idea. I hated fizzy lagers. And I loved English ale. But I found I couldn't drink fizzy lagers on their own. And I couldn't drink fizzy lagers with food because they were too bloating and gassy. And I used to go to Indian restaurants a lot. And the, the best drink with an Indian meal, if you don't want to drink water, is a chilled lager beer. 
but if it's chilled but fizzy, uncomfortable combination. Ale, which I was introduced to by my English friends, I love to this day, but I can't drink ale with any food. It's too heavy and it's too bitter. So I thought, how do I produce a beer that has the refreshment of a lager and the smoothness of an ale combined, that is really drinkable by anyone from anywhere in the world would like it, rounded, balanced, less gassy, but also accompanies all food, and in particular Indian food. And that was my idea for Kuru Beer. Hang on. How long has beer been around for? Forever. Yeah, Stella Artois was founded in the 14th century. Why didn't somebody think of doing this before? It's such a simple idea. And Cobra now is a household name, and it does exactly what I've described, you brewed smooth for all food. The beauty about big ideas is a hundred years from now, people will come up with simple ideas like Cobra beer, and people will say, why didn't somebody think of that? Four. Now, it's never an easy journey. How many of you want to be entrepreneurs, want to start your own business one day? Can I see a show of hands? Yeah, a few. Yeah, a few heads in hand. A lot of people want to. Will you do it? I tell you what, there's one word that sums up entrepreneurs more than any other word. Guts. You've got to have the guts to do it in the first place, to give up whatever other opportunity you have, working with Goldman Sachs or whatever it is. Yeah. Our first company car was a Citroen De Chevaux. You know the Citroen 2 CD, they look like people? It cost us 295 pounds, and I'm not exaggerating any of this. Bright green and battered. It needed push starting every day. And if you looked down when you were driving, you could see the unpredicted events, just like the big global events I've described to you. Same thing happens in business. I didn't predict those three crises. How did I get through them? Three things. Every time we're exactly the same. One, you have to have a strong brand. And if I were to ask you, what's a, what's a brand? Can anyone tell me what a brand is? Can somebody describe what a brand is? Oxford, brand. Harvard, brand. Can somebody just describe to me a brand? Put your hand up and try and have a go. Yes, please. It's a set of uh, values and identity associated with um, a name, for example. Yep. When I say, for example, you're an Apple user, I therefore assume a million and one things about you and, and what you value and what you use that product for. Yep. Um, the same way if you say you go to Oxford or Cambridge, um, I can assume a million and one things about who you are as a person and what you have. Okay, okay. So what makes an extraordinary brand? What, the, what makes it, based on what you've just said, what makes an extraordinary brand? Well, as you pointed out, you need to know exactly who your user is. So you talked about your um, Indian curry example, you know, as an example. You know exactly who your clientele is. You know exactly when they're using your product, why they're using the product, and you know exactly the experience they want to have while they're eating the curry on a, on a late Friday night after they've been out to, uh, to the clubs, or, or whatever the example is. Um, and you know exactly what your clientele value. Well done. So I'm just going to now put what you just said into two different descriptions. So one of my favorite professors at Harvard Business School is uh, Professor Francis Fry. And during the lockdown, we had these virtual lectures, and she gave a virtual lecture on trust. And I'm going to summarize a one-hour lecture in one minute. And she described trust as a triangle. To get trust, because you've got to trust a brand, to get trust, the three points of triangle, one is you've got to be authentic. Is it the real you that people are dealing with? The next corner of the triangle is logic. Do you have the ability to deliver what you're promising you're offering? Do you have the knowledge, professional ability, the capability to deliver it? And the third point of the triangle is empathy. Are you in it for yourself or are you in it for them? So if you're authentic, you have the logic, and you're empathetic, you can get trust from other people. And the next part of it is, 
You've got to trust a brand. And what makes an extraordinary brand? When I did my joint venture with Cobra Beer with Molson Coors, one of the biggest brewers in the world, the American-Canadian brewers, 15-year-old joint venture, they said, we want to do this joint venture for three reasons. We want you as a founder entrepreneur to be the chairman, which I am to this day. We want your team to come across, which they did. And you have an extraordinary brand. And we classify an extraordinary brand has to fulfill six things. And you can apply this to Oxford. You can apply this to Cobra Beer. One is it's based on an undeniable brand. In our case at Cobra, it's that extra smooth, less gassy taste that makes the best beer to drink with all food. Secondly, an extraordinary brand never compromises on its principles, it never takes any shortcuts. Third thing is an extraordinary brand has an instantly recognizable and iconic look. Those of you who put your hands up saying you know Cobra Beer, if you close your eyes, you can picture a bottle of Cobra Beer. Oxford, we all know the Oxford logo, yeah? it's, it, it, you can picture it, it's, it's iconic. <clears throat> Fourth thing is an extraordinary brand delivers a relevant and consistent experience. In my case, I produce hundreds of millions of bottles and cans and pints of Cobra beer, and you as a consumer expect the bottle before or the pint before to taste exactly the same as this one and the next one. You're unforgiving, uncompromising. That's very unfair, you know? <laughs> wine, I could pay a hundred pounds for a bottle of wine, and it's 2002. And I pay a hundred pounds for the 2003, and it tastes different. That's acceptable, because it's a different vintage. Come on. I'm using a natural process, using malted barley and wheat and rice and maize and hops and fermentation and three varieties of hops and a natural process and, and, the, and every season the products are different and you expect it to taste exactly the same. It's not fair, but anyway, you have to do it. Oxford has been doing this for 900 years. Cambridge for 800 years. You can't just say we're the best universities in the world. One year, you've got to do it every year. Relevant and consistent experience. Very difficult to be an extraordinary brand. Fifth thing an extraordinary brand does, and this is, the, in my view, the best. The fifth thing is an extraordinary brand produces loyal brand champions. In Oxford's case, you will always be proud to be Oxford alumni for the rest of your life. You'll be ambassadors for Oxford for the rest of your life. With Cobra beer, if you're a Cobra fan, you go into a restaurant and say, ah, two Cobras, please. Sorry, we don't stock Cobra. You walk up to the next restaurant. <laughs> you're disappointed. And the sixth thing, as an extraordinary brand, delivers extraordinary profits. So having an extraordinary brand is very important, and that can get you through any crisis. The next thing is having a loyal team that supports you and family support if you've got family. My wife I met one year after I started Cobra. She's been by my side through all the ups and downs. I wouldn't be here talking to you without her support. And finally, an extraordinary brand always, always practices integrity. Brand, team, integrity, and you can get through any crisis. Can you tell me the definition of integrity before I conclude, anyone? Volunteer, how do you define integrity? Anyone have a go? You again. <laughs> That's the reason. Uh, to do what's right when no one is looking. That's one definition I hear all the time. Thank you. Any others? Any others? Have a go. One more. Yes. When you do something unpopular or revolutionary even when it's like at the moment not popular? So do the right thing, whatever. Yeah. Okay. These are all, this is all that, absolutely. So the best definition I've ever heard is as patron of the Zoroastrian community in the UK, I welcomed the Archbishop of Canterbury to the Zoroastrian Centre in Harrow in London. And as a patron, I gave the welcoming speech. And then he, at that time, was Archbishop Rowan Williams. He made his speech, and he said, Lord Billamore has used the word integrity three times in his speech, and the Zoroastrian Parsi community are renowned for their integrity. He said the word integrity comes from the Latin and Greek words integra, integrum, which means wholeness, being complete. You cannot practice integrity if you're fragmented in front of the light. You can only practice integrity if you're whole and complete as an individual. So that's how you get through crises. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop. But before I stop, I will 
<coughs> give you the, the thing that we live by, and, I, and when people say, when you hire people, what do you look for? I look for one thing, one thing more than any other thing, is attitude. I hire for will rather than skill, ideally both, but it's the will that matters more for me. And our, our motto is at Cobra Beer, and, and the motto of my coat of arms is to aspire and achieve, which I stole from my great-grandfather. But we've added to it in Cobra, our motto is to aspire and achieve against all odds with integrity. Because it's always against all odds. And it's almost a definition of entrepreneurship. You come up with an idea, you want to get somewhere with the idea, you've got all the odds stacked against you, you've got little or no means, and you go out there and you make it happen. But most importantly, you do it the right way. You do it with integrity. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I'll just start with the question about the House of Lords, that's yes. all right. Yes. House of Lords reform is something that kind of comes up in the media and the news every you know, few times a year. It doesn't really seem to happen. So I just wonder if you think the House of Lords could be strengthened. Obviously its powers are pared down, for example, compared to like the US Senate. Yes. If you think a stronger House of Lords would be a good thing, and if so, what reforms do you think should be made, if any, um, to give the House of Lords more legitimacy? Okay. Thank you. Great question. First, firstly, how many of you, how many of you think the House of Lords uh, should be? Uh, at the moment, we're all appointed, yeah. I mean, I'm appointed for life. So, how many of you think the House of Lords should be elected? There's, um, there's no right or wrong. I just want to see what you think. Somebody saying that. Okay. How many of you think it should stay as it is appointed? Okay. Right. Let me answer this now for you. The, the, what I've learned with the House of Lords is it's a unique parliamentary chamber compared with any other in the world. There's no other all-appointed chamber that exists to the extent of the House of Lords. It's huge. I mean, the numbers are too big. There are about 800 of us. Um, where there is a check and balance on the House of Commons, 100 years ago, the Parliament Act meant that the House of Commons always gets its way. So unlike the American Senate, which can block legislation, or the Indian Rajya Sabha, the upper house, that can block legislation, we can never block legislation. We can only delay it for one year. So then you say, well, what's the point? I mean, you, you, they, they've got the final say. The point is that the House of Lords has the greatest depth and breadth of expertise of any parliamentary chamber in the world by far. I mean, America, let me tell you the depth and breadth of expertise Americans have. 50% of the senators are lawyers. Not a lot of diversity there. House of Lords, I'm not joking or exaggerating, every field you can think of, you have top of the world, world-class experts in the House of Lords. Your Chancellor <coughs> is a member of the House of Lords, Lord Patton, my colleague and friend. Heads of Oxford and Cambridge Colleges, former Vice-Chancellors of universities, Chancellors of other universities like me. <coughs> Academics, journalists, authors, medics, lawyers, former heads of the armed forces, former cabinet secretaries, former cabinet ministers. I could go on. The leading veterinary scientists. I mean, it's just amazing, the breadth of expertise. Uh, an example, the universities bill, when it went through in 2017, and Joe Johnson, Boris Johnson's brother, was the university's minister in the House of Commons, they sent us the bill, this act of parliament, to reform the university sector, gone through all the stages in the House of Commons, and it came to us. He used to come and watch the debates. Do you know how many times we amended that legislation? 1,000 times. Why? Because he said, hang on, you shouldn't be doing that, or you should have thought about that, or why aren't you doing this? Why? How many university leaders are there in the House of Commons? Zero. In the House of Lords, so many that 30 of us out of the university leaders took part actively in that legislation to make it better. So that's how it works. We have question time every day on a variety of subjects. And when I first joined, I, I mean, I'll give you one quick example. First joined, we had a, a question on the safety of Gibraltar Airport. What an obscure question. So the peer st stood up and said, I asked this question, standing in my name in the order papers. The minister obviously knew this question was there in writing and prepared, have prepared answer. Well, well, we know what uh, the noble order is talking about. There was an incident at Gibraltar Airport uh, where a plane had to uh, uh, abort its landing because a, a fire engine crossed the runway by mistake. 
So, but it'll never happen again. So then the peer gets a chance to respond. He said, how can the noble lord, the minister, say, I was in that plane and I nearly died? It's not a safe airport. And um, so then the minister said, no, no, we've taken care. We make sure never happens. Then it opens up. So the next peer stood up. As a former pilot in the Royal Air Force, I can tell you that Gibraltar Airport is a very difficult airport to land. And I think I'm probably the only noble lord here who has a personal experience. The minister responds and another peer said, I'd like to correct my noble friend. I too used to be a pilot and I've landed at Gibraltar Airport. And this is amazing. Next thing, the peer next to me stands up. As a former governor of Gibraltar, may I? <laughs> Where are you going to get that? It's incredible. It's priceless. And by the way, it costs nothing in terms. We don't. MPs get a salary, they get pensions, they get five staff. I get a daily allowance. I get no, I have to employ my assistants at my own expense. So we get this at phenomenal value of world class expertise. Uh, that is, and that is the expertise that the press reports on, that the public and the other house listens to, that improves, we challenge government, scrutiny, the debate, and that's how we add value. And it's only as good as the quality of what we input, and it's phenomenal. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. And there should be reform, by the way. When I, when I joined, you couldn't even retire from the House of Lords. You, you held your seat, even if you're too ill, and you're in old people's home, and you're not well enough to come to House of Lords, you couldn't give up your seat. We changed that so that now you can voluntarily retire if you feel you're not up to it anymore, which is, I mean, there's basic reforms like that. We still have 92 hereditary peers. And one time, until recently, you could only be a House of Lords until the 1950s if you, you inherited the title. Now, 92 of them are still in the House of Lords. So some people say, well, should they still be in the House of Lords? We should, you know, grandfather them out in that when they die or retire, they're not replaced. That could be a reform that takes place, but a lot of my... A lot of the heritage make a phenomenal contribution and keep that link with the past. So there's even a debate for them continuing. So anyway, that's answering you. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Uh, first of all, on behalf of Oxford Finance Society, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming and for your wonderful words, wonderful words so far. Um, on the uh, business side, I'd like to ask you a question about the differences between <coughs> working in different countries. And with Cobra being such a global brand at the moment, uh, what kind of stuff have you experienced in terms of culture and regulation across the world, maybe in differences yeah. between the UK and India, for example? Well, if, I, if, I, if you give me three countries that I have more experience than others in, in, in working and interacting uh, are India, the UK, and the United States of America. And they're very different cultures. And in my visits to Harvard every year, you, it's a completely different mindset and approach and it's, it's phenomenal. It's, it is different. But you've got to, I believe, respect it, work with it, and, and take the best out of it. India. I mean, India. How many of you have been to India here? Can I see? Okay. If you've been to India, how many have been to India in the last year? I tell you, you go to India. I go to India sometimes six, seven times a year. It is flying as a country. I mean, okay, there's still lots of poverty. Its per capita income is still very low. But it's now, in absolute terms, the fifth largest economy in the world. I mean, I predict that by 2060, India will be the largest economy in the world. It, it is absolutely, you know, it's, it's that, that station express has left the, it, it's left the station. It's flying. Um, the entrepreneurial spirit that you have in India. And yet, you, have, you still have bureaucracy, but that bureaucracy is diminishing. You have you know, corruption. The corruption is diminishing. Transparency is increasing. The ability for people to get anywhere from anywhere is phenomenal. People are, you have almost overnight success with people just because of the technology ability. They've leapfrogged a lot of technology compared with us over here um, in, in India in many ways. So, but you've got to work within a federal system. And India is a true, like America. So each state in India and America is like a little mini country in itself. They have their own laws, they have their own taxes. Um, and yet you're under this big federal system which has a common defense policy, common foreign policy. So working in a federal system is very different. I mean, over here we have well, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, devolved administration, so we have an element of that over here as well. So it's very, very different. And, and the scale of India, 1.4 billion people, the distances you travel, the diversity of the country is the most diverse country in the world in every way, whether it's religion or whether it's race or whether it's terrain or whether it's language, huge diversity. 
um, America the scale of it, 350 million people, and we're 68 million people here. So it, it, you've got to get used to operating at different levels, but the basic principles of business, the legal systems, the wavelength, if you cut through it all in America, India, and the UK are the same, and that really helps. The education systems are very similar, um, so that helps as well. Thank you. Excellent. I think we're going to start to open up to the audience. Um, if you have questions. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, yeah, right there. Okay, so thank you for giving the presentation. I was specifically interested in Cobra. So you said that one of the six key conditions for a good brand is making profits. And I, with regards to kind of like the alcoholic beverage industry, I know there's been a trend of like premiumization, um, also like rising incomes within Southeast Asia. Um, and also kind of the trend towards kind of lower alcoholic beverages. So I wanted to know how Cobra is adapting to this changing of the environment. Thank you very much. You see, the reality is uh, we've been doing a non-alcoholic Cobra for a while, called Cobra Zero, and uh, non-alcoholic beers are disgusting. I mean, they, taste, <laughs> they taste awful. And so my challenge was how can I make a non-alcoholic beer that actually tastes like beer? And we found a brewery in Holland, and for years we produced non-alcoholic beer in Holland. And then my joint venture partners, then that brewery in Holland suddenly said, we can't make it for you, there was a change of ownership. They said, we're no longer going to make this beer for you anymore. Now sometimes, you know, when, when, when something like that happens, you say, damn, you know, now what am I going to do? If you take advantage of an opportunity like that, and you say, well, I, well, I still want to keep doing a non-alcoholic beer, so... I've got to find somewhere that can produce as good a non-alcoholic beer as this. Within our own group of Molson Coors, we have a brewery in Serbia where we're now producing Cobra Zero using a new technique called vacuum distillation. And I'm not exaggerating. You try a Cobra Zero that's available in small silver cans, that's now available in the UK. It is by far the best tasting non-alcoholic beer ever. It tastes like real beer. And, you know, from being, oh, God, they've let us down in Holland, now we've got a much better product. And it's fantastic. So, in fact, in, in blind taste, people can't even, they, you said, do you realize you've been drinking a non-alcoholic beer? They don't, they don't believe it. So that is to answer one question. The other thing is, that I, did, I gave you my um, six categories for an extraordinary brand. I also have my 10 Ps that can apply to any institutional business. Okay? It's a checklist that I go through. You can apply it to Oxford University, by the way. So first, you've got to have a great product. In our case, a super premium product. Um, next, it's got to be at the right price. You probably all say it's Oxford's far too expensive, but anyway, you get what you pay for. And in Cobra's case, a premium product is more expensive, but you can have a value for money product, which is cheaper. It has to be cheaper. The third thing is place. It's got to be available. In our case, it's 6,000 Indian restaurants and restaurants and bars and pubs and thousands of off-licenses and supermarkets and cash and carries and 40 countries were exported to. You've got to have availability. Fourth is promotion. You've got to promote the brand. In, in our early days, we couldn't even afford a branded beer glass. You know, we just had one flimsy table tent card was our, was our item of marketing. So people got to read about what this new beer all about. Now, of course, you've got advertising and PR and social media and point of sale, the best beer glass in the world. Um, so promotion. How many of you have studied marketing over here? Do you recognize that as the four P's of marketing? I've got six extra P's. <laughs> I chair the Manufacturing Commission in Parliament, and I'm a very proud manufacturer. And Britain is still one of the top ten manufacturers in the world. It makes up less than 10% of our GDP, but we're still one of the top ten in absolute terms of manufacturers. We're world-class manufacturers in aerospace, in, in automobiles, in beer, you name it, we're fantastic. Um, but people is the most important thing. Whether you're a manufacturer, whether you're services, whether you're B2B or B2C, people are the most important thing in any business. The sixth P is finance, spelled PH. You can't do anything without the money. And the biggest challenge when you're an entrepreneurial com company starting from scratch, and you've got no collateral to offer, no security, no money, your new brand, an unknown brand, you're unknown, you have zero credibility, is raising finance. It's really, really tough. The next P, is partnership. Most businesses start with a business partner, but they don't often last. You've seen social networks, and Mark Zuckerberg and his partner, 
or Bill Gates and his partner, or Richard Branson and his partners. They don't last. My partner left after six years. He's still one of my best friends, by the way. Um, so, but I'm talking about partnership as an approach, as an attitude. So you've got to have a partnership approach where you treat your employees as partners, you treat your shareholders as partners, you treat your bankers as partners, your lawyers as partners, your accountants as partners, your consumers as partners, your customers as partners. Everyone is a partner. Next P is principles. It's better to fail doing the right thing than to succeed doing the wrong thing. Uh, the fourth P is passion. You've got to love what you're doing. And my advice to you, whatever career you choose to do, choose a career you're going to love and enjoy. Because follow your passion, not your pension. And final P is profits. You've got to make good profits. So those are my 10 Ps of building a business. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'll start slightly through, dog. It fights quite directly with some of the industry giants like Diageo and such. How did you navigate entering such an industry dominated by players like that? Yeah. See, the first thing is you, you're up against all the odds. When you start, you're unknown. You know, nobody knew about Cobra. It's a brand new brand. They created from scratch. And, of course, everyone thinks you don't stand a chance. My father had become commander-in-chief of the Central Indian Army. He had 350,000 troops under his command. And while I was in India developing the product with this brewery in Bangalore, I'd go up and meet, you know, spend some time with my parents in an army house, command house, this beautiful big house, and, 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 and you know, I knew my father couldn't afford to give me any money. He was an army officer in those days. He got paid really badly. I thought at least he'd give me some emotional support, moral support. What are you doing? <laughs> All this education? And you're becoming an import-export voila. <laughs> Get a proper job. But he became my biggest fan once we succeeded. So, yeah, <coughs> I, people don't think you stand a chance, and, and theoretically. There's a very famous Harvard Business School professor called Michael Porter, and he's got the Porter's Five Forces Market Entry Analysis. So you've got, to, you've got to check these five things before you even think of entering a market. I would have failed all five. I would have failed all five of those tests. And then you're up against giants. Kingfisher, the biggest beer brand in India. To this day, 50% of beer sold in India is Kingfisher. They've been here for eight years. In the UK, they were brewing in the UK. They had thousands of draft beer installations already in the UK. Carlsberg was in every single Indian restaurant. Why would they want to deal with me and my unknown brand? So, and of course, not only do they are they established, but many of them ancient. As I told you, Stella Artois, 14th century. Kingfisher over 100 years old. Grosch, 400 years old. Carlsberg, 150 years old. They're all well established, deep pockets, advertising budgets. <coughs> And you're nothing. So how do you, when it's against all the odds, take on these giants? And of course, it's not easy sailing. First they ignore you. This is what Mahatma Gandhi is saying. First they ignore you. Then they attack you. Finally they accept you. So I went through all those stages. First they said, who is this young guy? He's too young. We've got no money, no experience. They ignore you. The distributors wouldn't even talk to us. Then once we, they saw us selling to all the restaurants, the top restaurants were reordering it, they got worried and started attacking us. Finally, they had to accept us. Today, we're six times bigger than Kingfisher in the UK. And we're the biggest Indian beer brand outside India, against all the odds. So it, it's never easy. Um, it's always against the odds. But if you really believe in yourself and your product and your idea and your brand, you're producing something that's different and better, the less gassy, extra smooth taste that makes it better to go with food, what does that mean? The restaurant sells more beer. They make more money. They're happy customers. So if your product delivers and you've got something different, genuinely different, that uh, adds value, you can succeed. Thank you. Great. These are great questions, but thank you very much. Yeah. Um, to come back to something you started with, um, to Brexit, um, maybe frust kind of the causes that lead to Brexit, you mentioned, for example, rural and city differences, but um, if we make the connection to globalization that you made, um, maybe there's a case for Brexit from the perspective of people who felt left behind by globalization and since you since you mentioned your manufacturing um, experience maybe there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of like that frustration coming through especially with people who work in or have worked in the manufacturing industry um, but also a sense that globalization as a whole is a great thing for us like if we couldn't maybe you couldn't get cobra beer without globalization in that sense so how do we manage to keep globalization to push back against things like Brexit, 
or establish that it's an absolutely horrible idea while giving everyone the feeling to profit from the globalization. Um, and so can manufacturing or big business that profits from that, how can they contribute to making that happen? And you, know, you, you can call it whatever you want to call it inclusive growth, uh, call it equitable growth, call it you know, doing whatever way you want to describe it. Um, people get left behind. And how can you, then you're down to a government creating an environment where you have that safety net. So, I mean, the welfare state that exists here and in the EU is huge, huge compared with any other country in the world. Um, we have a safety net. We're wealthy countries. And yet people still feel they're, they're left behind. Immigration. One of the main reasons Brexit took place was um, immigration, a fear of immigration. If you remember 2015, 2016, because of the Arab Spring, and we had the, the horrible situation in Syria, and people coming across, and the tragedies in the Mediterranean, and Angela Merkel saying she'd let in a million. And what did the, 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 the Nigel Farage and the Brexit party at that time, the UKIP, they said, oh, all those million people are going to come to the UK. We're going to take your jobs. International students. I co-chaired the all-party parliamentary group on international students. I'm the president of UKISA, the UK Council for International Student Affairs, and looks after the, as all the international students, all our universities. How many of you in this room are international students? Can I just see a show of hands? Okay, thank you. Now, I can, I'm a former international student. There's this perception, oh, international students take away places from our domestic students. And there was a Sunday Times scandal just recently, and I did a radio interview in Times Radio. I said, people must understand the facts. What percentage of international students in the undergraduate students in the UK? You know, it's only 15%. Only 15% of undergraduates in this country are international students. Where do we take away places from other undergraduate students? Master's courses, it's over 40%. If we didn't have those over 40% international students, many of those master's <coughs> courses would collapse. We wouldn't be able to afford and the sad thing is, as a university chancellor, I can tell you, the fees for domestic students is fixed at 9250 for a domestic student. That has stayed fixed for many years, and we've had high inflation over the last few years. The real value of that 9250 is today £6,000. Hang on. My income as a university has gone down by one-third, and at the same time I've had inflation, so my costs have gone up. If you tell me in Cobra I've got to reduce my prices by one-third and my costs are going to go up as on the other side, I'm going to go bust. And yet we're still meant to produce the best universities in the world along with the United States of America. Four out of the top ten universities are British universities. Seventeen out of the top 100, including Birmingham, are British universities. And we're less than 1% of the world's population. And we're meant to do this with that scenario of 9,250 fixed and costs increasing. Around. So it's not easy when you're operating that environment. With immigration, I spoke in a debate just now in the House of Lords 9.25 million people in this country of working age, between the ages of 16 and 64, don't work. Hang on. 9.25 million out of 68 million people, that's our population, don't work. Some are ill, some have retired early. Many reasons they don't work, but they don't work. And yet we have labor shortages in just about every sector. Dentistry. Did you all hear about the dentist scandal just recently? Shortage of dentists. It's scandalous. 168 million pounds, billion pounds, is the budget of the NHS. Do you know how much is spent on dentistry? Three billion. What? Heaven. Come on, you've all had a, a tooth problem of some sort. It's debilitating. NHS is free at the point of delivery. Dentistry is not free at the point of delivery, although it's part of the NHS a lot of it. It's shocking. I challenge the government on this. At Birmingham University, we have one of the biggest and best dental schools in the country. Do you know how many dental graduates there are per year in the whole of the UK? 1,000. That's it. I challenge them, oh, Lord Birmingham, we'll increase it by 40% soon. Oh, and we'll allow some foreign dentists to come in as well because we need them. Now, why don't you do that in every sector? 
every sector from agricultural workers to finance to manufacturing to academia to the NHS. The NHS would collapse without foreign workers, whether it's nurses or doctors. So we need to have a healthy attitude to immigration, where good immigration is great for Britain. Bad immigration, nobody wants <coughs> the boats coming across the channel and the tragedies that they cause. Everyone would say, you've got to stop that. Illegal immigration is bad, but the immigration that is good, and by the way, the biggest mistake that we make in this country, do you realize this net migration figure? Do you know what the net migration figure is in this country at the moment? 820,000? No. Well, the latest figure is around 700,000. You know, it may be 800 the next time it's uh, you know, disclosed. But that figure seems very scary to the public. And the government, a lot of members of the government, will scare the public, saying, oh, look at this, so high. Do you know what the largest number in that figure is? Does anyone know what the, oh, out of that 700,000? Largest component? International students. They're treated as immigrants. I ask, why? The United Nations definition of an immigrant is anyone who stays in a country for one year. Now, international <coughs> students, if you come here for a one-year master's, the most popular course for international students, you're treated as an immigrant. Other countries like Australia and America, Canada, will present the UN figures as the 700,000, but they will exclude when they present as temporary migrants, international <coughs> students, and the rest of people who come to work, or an asylum, refugees. Then the figures are nowhere near as scary. So, we, you know, we have an, I'm sorry, but at the moment we've got an anti immigration government, anti universities government, anti international students government. And I don't agree with it. I think we should be grateful for our international students. By the way, £42 billion. Thank you for the money. <laughs> <laughs> That's like our defense budget. And the generation long links. My grandfather, both my grandparents were. were one was a cadet at Sandhurst, the military academy. 1931, he graduated. My other grandfather was at Birmingham University in the 1920s, graduated in 1931. Almost 100 year association with Birmingham and my family. My mother was, at, was there in the 50s. My uncle was there in the 60s. I went to British University. My children at British University and graduates at British University. And world leaders, any one time, not an exaggeration, 25% of world leaders have been educated in British universities. The other 25% have been educated in American universities and the other 50%, all the other countries in the world put together. Look at that soft power. It's priceless. Thank you. As an international student, thank you so much for that and for speaking with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Are we concluding it now? I think we're all at time for this talk, but we're going to go into the so area of Can I make two oh, remarks? Absolutely. So, firstly, pleasure to be with all of you. I leave you with two things. The best lecture that I've ever attended, apart from the one I told you about globalization, was given by a Professor Clay Christensen, one of the greatest business school professors ever to have lived at Harvard Business School. He came in, and he, uh, this was a, there were two sections. It was a, my final lecture before I became an alumnus. And 200 of us in the room. And he said, I apologize. This is the first lecture I'm giving in a long time because I've been very ill. Giant, six foot eight. And uh, he said, I had cancer. I've recovered from the cancer. And then I got a stroke, and I've recovered from the stroke. And he said, the thing about the stroke is you can see it hasn't affected my movements, but it's affected my mind. When I speak, I sometimes can't find the words that I want to say. And he said, in this lecture, if that happens, could you shout out the words? It might save some time. And you know, we had to shout out the words many, many times. At the end of that lecture, he was in, in, in tears, and we were in tears. And the message of his lecture was this. He said to every one of us, have you stopped and thought, what is the purpose of my life? And I ask each one of you, have you stopped to think, what is the purpose of your life? And he said, linked to that, how will you measure your life? That's a very individual question, very individual answer. And I will never forget it. And by the way, he's an Oxford alumnus as well, apart from the Harvard alumnus. And the, and the second thing I will say to you, so purpose of your life, and the next thing is my, my favorite saying of Mahatma Gandhi's, uh, is believe in yourselves. That's the key. Attitude, belief. Because your beliefs become your thoughts, and your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits form your character, and your character determines your destiny. So I wish you all the best. Thank you.